There is no emotion more delicate than love. Opening your arms and exposing your heart to someone can, quite bluntly, be terrifying, especially if you inadvertently give it to a reckless partner. When Lily James crossed paths with Paul Fissian, she likely hoped that the two would be a perfect match for each other. Sadly, she soon learned that he was not the kind of man she was looking for. The fragility that I spoke about works both ways. It's a sad reality that, while many doors to new relationships open, most of them will eventually close. And while many accept this cold and harsh fact, the rare few never do, paving the way to stalking, denial, anger, violence, and even murder. And sadly, Paul Fissian's actions in the following days would shock the city of Sydney beyond belief. Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're in Sydney to look at a case that gripped this city for all of the wrong reasons. Paul Fissian was a seemingly good person, and Lily James, she was extraordinary. But following a chance encounter in the year 2023, their brief relationship would end in the most brutal of ways. As you can tell, this video is slightly different to the usual, but Coffeehouse Crime posts international true crime cases here weekly. So if that does sound like a kind of thing, please consider subscribing. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee and come along with me for the deep dive. This is the case of Lily James. G'day folks, and welcome to Sydney. Despite losing the title of Australia's most populated city to Melbourne in 2023, Sydney is likely still seen as Australia's most iconic. And with the Opera House, Sydney Harbour Bridge, and Darling Harbour, it is easy to see why. The city's never-ending desire to build around the bay makes it extremely unique. As a result, Sydney is left with incredible views from many angles, and also has one of the busiest waterways on the planet. Planet. With the Blue Mountains to the west, and dozens of beaches on its eastern coastline, anyone with an affinity towards outdoor activities is spoiled for choice here. And although Sydney's coffee couldn't possibly live up to Melbourne's golden standards, I do admit it's not bad at all. Sydney's love of coffee stems from the 18th century, when the first fleet brought coffee beans to Australia's shores. And this, coupled with the arrival of immigrants from Italy, France, Turkey, and Greece during the 19th century, led to to the first coffee houses in Australia opening in Sydney, making way to give rise to the city's now ardent cafe culture. Coffee aside, our story today begins in the suburb of San Susi, which can be found around 10 miles south of Sydney's central business district. The rather odd name comes from a French term which can be translated to without care, deliberately a perfect representation of Australia's chilled out way of life. With just over 10,000 residents, San Susi is a primarily residential area with multiple beaches and a small shopping strip. It's a great place to settle down and have a family. And scaling back just a year, this is where we could have found Lily James and the James family. Born on May the 21st, 2002, Lily James was the daughter of her beloved parents, Jamie and Peter. And alongside her brother Max, the two were quite close to their grandmother, Barbara. Growing up in such an eclectic city, Lily was exposed to a high quality of life. She was known to be an independent and vibrant young woman, who was always on the go and lived each day to the fullest. Loyal, fun, and bright. These are three words commonly used to describe her. And friends, relatives, colleagues, and acquaintances all agreed she was an absolute joy to be around. After graduating from Dane Bank Anglican School for Girls in 2020, she went on to study sports business at the University of Technology, Sydney. Lily was naturally ambitious and worked hard to achieve her goals and dreams. She loved to dance, and despite her busy schedule, she still made time to support her brother Max, her friends, and family. Now, outside of working and studying, she also loved to play water polo, so much so that she was even employed as a part-time water polo coach by St. Andrew's Cathedral School. And this school was where she would meet someone extremely crucial to this case, and his name was Paul Fissian. 
Born in 1999, Paul was the son of an affluent Dutch family in the Netherlands. His mother Steph and father Esther were high-flying corporate parents, and despite their ever-demanding corpo lives, they loved their only child. His father was a consultant in marketing and communications, and following an opportunity to move from the Netherlands to Australia, the family relocated to Sydney in 2015. This paved the way for Paul to attend St Andrews School in Sydney, where soon enough he soon became a sports captain and part of the school leadership team. And although he would return to the Netherlands with his parents in 2018, he soon returned after graduating from university. By 2020, he once again found himself living in one of the world's most exciting, albeit expensive, cities. Sydney's high price tag comes with the promise of sun, excellent healthcare and sports, and stellar education. Which actually was perfect for Paul, because he planned to become a sports teacher. He continued to work at St Andrews Cathedral School as a cricket and hockey coach. In addition to this, he also became an after-hours coordinator while studying for a Masters of Teaching. Living in a semi-detached house in Kensington, he hardly knew his other three housemates. They described him as polite and courteous, yet sometimes messy. Not that it mattered too much, as he was hardly ever in. Many adults saw Paul as a high-achieving young man who was bound to become successful, but sadly, that is where the compliments end. Allegedly, some of the students around Paul felt rather uncomfortable around him, with some even reporting to their friends that he was behaving quite creepily. Apparently, he was rather flirtatious with the younger female students and had a wandering eye, and this made many of them feel unsettled in their environment. He was also described as arrogant by former peers, objectified women, and was not liked by many of the men around him. Unfortunately, Paul bore all of the typical red flags, most of which were seemingly well hidden. He was quite narcissistic, had a fragile ego, and wanted to control all of his relationships. Again, many of these red flags were not apparent from the outset, so Paul would have had plenty of opportunity to catch a woman's attention before they noticed who he really was. And tragically, Lily was one of those people. With Lily and Paul working at St Andrew's Cathedral School, it was only a matter of time before they crossed paths. And fast forward several months to September of 2023, and the two had began dating. Now, it isn't precisely clear why, but the two began their relationship secretly, perhaps in an effort to prevent rumors spreading at school. Close friends and family knew that the two were dating, but in general, the relationship was kept under wraps. Despite their newfound relationship, Lily was quick to find both discomfort and concern. Where a new partner is usually filled with excitement and happiness, she simply wasn't feeling it. And so, after five weeks of being together, she decided to call it off. This decision clearly was the best for her, but that doesn't mean that Paul was ready to accept Lily's choice and the breakup was sure to leave him upset. In fact, he was furious. Now, the average person apparently goes through three to four major breakups in their lifetime, but we can't even call this a significant one. Paul and Lily were only seeing each other for around five weeks before breaking up, and the way that Paul emotionally reacted was far beyond acceptable even for the most serious of relationships. Students and friends always assumed that Paul had a fragile ego. Sadly, he was about to prove it in one of the most deplorable ways possible. And tragically, it would all come at the expense of Lily's life. October 26th, 2023. Over the course of the evening, concern grew in the James household. Lily, who usually made her way home on time, was nowhere to be found. Furthermore, she wasn't replying to her phone calls or messages. With her unexpected absence, both of Lily's parents were becoming worried. In fact, her father had become so nervous that he called the police to report her missing. And sadly, their fears would only escalate from here. Lily's disappearance would be short-lived. As the news began to spread around family and close friends, 
her father received a strange text message. Although this message came from Lily's phone, it didn't sound like her. She had asked him to pick her up from school, which was unusual at this time of night. By now, her father had become desperate. He wanted to make sure that his daughter was okay, and so, in a bid to find comfort, he headed out the front door to pick her up at St. Andrew's Cathedral School. Tragically, he would be met with devastation. After arriving at the school, Jamie immediately sensed that something was wrong. The school itself was surrounded by police cars, with multiple areas cordoned off and no way to get in. Something bad had happened here, but the details were not yet clear. That is when Jamie's world came crashing down. The authorities had been tipped by an anonymous caller, declaring that a body could be found on the school grounds and that it should be investigated. Officers soon arrived at the school shortly before Lily's father and they were met with a confronting scene. The body of a young woman was found in the bathroom of the school's gymnasium. Upon entering, they realized there were evident signs of a struggle. The victim had been bludgeoned to death, had tragically been hit many times with a hammer. That victim was soon identified to be Lily James. This news would be sure to rip a hole into the local community of Sydney. Lily was a much-loved teacher, now callously murdered on the very grounds she worked on and was supposed to feel safe. As for her killer, whoever they were, they were nowhere to be found. Amid this unfolding tragedy, parents and teachers found themselves deeply concerned about the well-being of their students. Murder in a downtown school in Sydney sent shockwaves throughout the community. This sort of tragedy was simply unheard of and many were wondering how such a thing could happen. As the news circulated, speculations and rumours spread like wildfire, and many wondered who would target such a gentle and compassionate young woman. Close friends and family found themselves contemplating her various connections, and it didn't take long for them to think about Paul and his various motives. But the authorities were already aware that he may have something to do with his now ex-girlfriend's death, and even more suspiciously, he was nowhere to be found. The authorities were able to establish Lily's murder to be between the time of 7 and 8 p.m., with the anonymous call coming into the authorities around four hours later at midnight. With knowledge of her death, it was likely that the caller was responsible or related to her murder. With four to five hours to spare, the caller could have long disappeared into the expansive regional area of Australia. However, interestingly enough, analysts were soon able to trace the call to Vaucluse. That being an eastern suburb only five miles away from the school. Now, Vaucluse is a beautiful part of Sydney, and also one of the most expensive suburbs to live in. It overlooks the harbour to the west, and more notably, the expansive sea to the east. The anonymous phone call was traced to Diamond Bay Reserve, located along the eastern coast of Vaucluse. And with its steep cliffs and rocky drop, this place is known to be particularly dangerous. And as you will soon come to find out later in this video, my personal experience determined that it's a gorgeous yet very dangerous place to be when off the beaten path. More specifically, The Gap is infamous for being a place where many people take their own lives. And while being here, I could feel a lot of sadness found behind its beauty. Eventually, police officers determined that the call originated from Paul's phone. However, by the time they arrived, he was long gone. After digging through surveillance footage, which was recorded by a private home, detectives were met with more concerning clues. As it turns out, a security camera of one of the local houses picked up more than Paul had bargained for. At 8.47pm, roughly one hour after Lily's murder, a Lexus vehicle parked along the curb of Crispang Crescent, with this street being found right next to Diamond Bay Reserve and the Gap. At 9.04pm, 
The driver emerged from the vehicle before walking westward. The man appeared to be holding a bag and was carrying a relatively calm posture. After identification, it is confirmed that this man was Paul Thyssen. Eight minutes later, at 9.12pm, he was once again spotted walking eastwards towards his car. He remained there for 36 minutes before turning it on at 9.49. He then drove away into the night. It is noted that Paul only he called the authorities two hours after being captured by the surveillance footage on this road. He was then seen driving off in that direction, never to be seen again. Before driving away, he was spotted walking in that direction towards the cliffside and a nearby bin. By daylight, his vehicle was found in a nearby car park. But as for the man himself, he was nowhere to be found. For the next 24 hours, police frantically searched for Paul. By now, he had been identified in the surveillance footage found at the school indicating that he was likely involved with Lily's murder. But sadly, officers would never have the opportunity to interview him, because the very next morning, on Friday the 27th of October, tradesmen found his body at the bottom of these cliffs. Coincidentally, the gap had already been sectioned off for routine renovations. Looking across the gap, they spotted what appeared to be a body amongst the rocks found at the bottom of the cliffs. And sadly, they were correct in their assumptions. At 9am, police helicopters and boats arrived to retrieve the unidentified body. Strong winds on the day made the operation extremely challenging. The ocean was rough, and as you can see, large swells were at the base of the cliff. After sectioning off the area, the authorities found a bin that contained Paul's items and a hammer. By noon, the body had been retrieved and identified to belong to a white male. Identification would take a while though. The body was bloated and shattered from the cliffs and harsh waters. Soon enough though, through fingerprint technology and records held at the Dutch Embassy, the body was identified to belong to Paul Thyssen. It appeared that the coward had decided to take the easy way out instead of face the consequences. To add to the already incomprehensible feelings of pain and frustration, Lily's family and friends were now faced with the prospect of never finding closure. And instead of finding the closure they so desperately needed from Paul, they were left with more questions than before, with no way of answering them. Paul's death almost certainly confirmed that he was the one to blame. He seemingly had a deep issue with control, and wanted to maintain it right until his final breath. In a world where he survived, Paul would have likely faced his trial here at the Supreme Court of New South Wales, where he could have faced life behind bars. Over the following days, officers constructed a timeline of what precisely happened on that fateful night of October the 25th. Let's begin in mid-September. After crossing paths, Paul and Lily started to secretly date in the middle of this month. Three weeks later, Paul Thyssen and Lily James visited a friend in Bourclues. Not only did this location hold some sort of sentimental significance to their relationship, but this is also likely how he knew of the gap. Sadly though, the relationship would not last very long. It is reported that Paul was controlling and aggressive towards Lily, and knowing that he was no longer someone that she wanted in her life, she called the relationship off roughly two weeks after visiting Bourclues. Paul's anger and frustration simmered for multiple days after the breakup. He was devastated, but instead of focusing on how he could become a better partner in the future, he refused to allow Lily control over her own life. On the day of Lily's murder, Paul travelled to a local hardware store and purchased a hammer, clearly displaying premeditation in killing or at least harming his former girlfriend. He then rented out a silver 2003 Lexus sedan and drove it towards St Andrew's Cathedral School. At around 7pm that night, and following her shift at school, Lily James was spotted by a surveillance camera entering the gymnasium's toilets. Although this surveillance footage is not currently available to the public, Paul was spotted following her, with multiple witnesses reviewing this surveillance footage and confirming his identity. An altercation followed, sadly ending in Lily's death. She was beaten and bludgeoned to death with a hammer, and tragically, had been assaulted so badly that her face was no longer recognisable. Paul spent over an hour in the bathroom before leaving shortly after 8pm. He then jumped in his car and drove to Diamond Bay Reserve, known as The Gap. 
That is when a surveillance camera captured him at 8.47 p.m. As we know, he made a short trip away from the car before returning. It is believed that he dumped the hammer and his belongings in this bin in that time frame. Paul then drove away and parked his car in a nearby car park. He then phoned the authorities to inform them of her body, anonymously confessing that she had been murdered and her body was in one of the school's bathrooms. After that, Paul callously messaged Lily's father, pretending to be her as he asked him to pick her up from school. Criminologists speculate that Paul's motive for sending those text messages was either to ensure that Lily's body would be found, or to potentially alter the time at which the police believed she had died. It isn't known what Paul was up to in the two hours between the surveillance footage and calling the authorities, but we do know that in the hours after his phone call, he made his way to the gap, walked to the cliff's edge, and then jumped. The authorities found his airpods on this rock nearby. By 4.30am, St Andrews School emailed all students' parents to inform them that the school would be closed for the rest of the week due to a critical incident. The school also brought in professional therapists to provide support to students, teachers and parents and all exams happening at the time were moved to separate buildings. By 11am, Lily's death had been confirmed by the authorities, and what also became glaringly apparent was that Paul was nowhere to be found. However, what they didn't know at the time is that he too was dead. Meanwhile, Paul's body remained undetected for just over 24 hours before being discovered by tradesmen working on the past renovations behind me. Following her death, the former headmaster of St Andrews Cathedral School received heavy criticism after describing Paul, of all people, as an absolute delight and not a monster. But context is important here. In full, Dr Collier said, What is chilling about the tragedy which unfolded at St Andrews, the shock and grief of which will cascade for a long time, is that the young man concerned was, in everybody's estimation, an absolute delight. He appeared to be just like the best of us. The important detail to take away here is that Paul seemed to be like everybody else. People capable of monstrous actions are all around us, and nobody would have ever suspected this from Paul. I think it's important here to note that Dr. Collier was not justifying Paul in any way, but rather highlighting that he had masked his actual self around the public. To this day, nobody understands why Paul reacted in such an aggressive and permanent way to the breakup. He was young, successful, and had a very prosperous future ahead of him. And sure, he may have been a douchebag, but he had plenty of time to mature into a thoughtful and kind man. Some do speculate that the 18 months of isolation he had during COVID-19 may have affected him badly, but personal opinion that doesn't change anything. Most of us had to go through that. It has left many students confused, because although some of them do refer to him as a creep, others say he was a good friend who cared about his students. Quite honestly, his behaviour is simply incomprehensible. It also appears that her murder was premeditated. In the hours prior to her death, he rented out a car and purchased a hammer before finding her. In fact, the car even suggests that he may have planned to dispose of her body in hopes that she would never be found. For all we know, he may have continued with his life afterwards as if nothing had happened. Following Paul's death, his parents decided that they would not repatriate their only child's body to the Netherlands, and would instead have him cremated before scattering his ashes in Sydney. Enough about Paul though, who really matters here is Lily. Lily's family, who understandably still don't understand how Paul murdered their daughter in such a public place, are considering suing the school for compensation over her death. With this happening in a public bathroom, they are currently trying to understand how he was able to conduct such a violent assault without anyone hearing or seeing the attack. The James family will also question why the elite inner city school, where annual fees exceed 40,000 Australian dollars, still does not employ security guards overnight. Understandably, there is a lot of frustration and anger behind these extremely valid questions, and I sincerely hope that they find the answers they so desperately deserve. Sadly, like many other countries across the globe, 
the number of intimate partner homicides has been increasing over the years. However, saying that, the Australian Institute of Criminology does come with some rather positive news. The intimate partner homicide rate per 100,000 population in Australia is decreasing. It's just that, with an increase in population, the overall number of intimate homicides is climbing. Yet, of course, we can always strive to push this figure to zero. Refocusing here from a broad to a personal lens, it is easy to see that Lily's death was entirely avoidable and should never have happened. Sadly, Paul's behavior was not predictable, but one could argue that the school should have had a security guard or system in place to protect Lily from Paul. After all, he was alone with her in that bathroom for more than one hour before fleeing. It's terrible to realize that questions over security require a tragedy like this to happen first. Lily's close friends remember her with fondness. They continue to describe her as the nicest and kindest person they have ever met. She is remembered as full of vitality, energy, enthusiasm, and a natural fit for the community she served. Lily's bright, bubbly personality will be dearly missed by those who knew her. She was a vibrant, smart, compassionate young lady who impacted the lives of many at her school, and hundreds, including myself, are utterly heartbroken by her death. Following her death, Lily's friends left heartfelt messages both online and offline. One friend said, There was nothing that you couldn't do, beautiful girl. Fly high, Lil. We will miss you forever. Another wrote, Lily was the most kind, caring, funny, and supportive friend there is. I could never think that we would lose our friends in these circumstances. Her funeral was private to those who knew her, with some sections being live-streamed to the school where she worked. I hope that those close to her will find peace in the coming years, and I also hope that, eventually, her story will help protect others in the future. With beautiful weather, an eclectic and vibrant culture, and many things to do, Sydney truly is a magnificent place to be. In fact, it is often ranked as one of the most livable cities in the world. But just like everywhere, that doesn't mean that it's exempt from danger. Sydney will never forget Lily's name. And while walking around this city, it has become evident to me that she has touched the hearts of many. Behind every tragedy, there is a lesson to be learned. And whether that be in the form of heightening security or improving mental health facilities, we should never stop in our desire to make our cities a safer place for everyone. To this day, it isn't precisely clear what Paul plans to do with himself and with Lily. Was this his plan all along? If it was, then why did he rent out the vehicle? Did he plan to perhaps dump her body elsewhere and carry on with his life as if nothing had happened? Unfortunately, Paul is the only one to know the answers to these questions. Questions which will never be fully understood. And also, as you likely noticed, this is a slight change to our usual format. So with that in mind, while you're in the comments section, let me know what you think. If you'd like to follow me in my adventures, then please check out my social media here, most notably my Instagram. And I think that's pretty much going to end this video today, folks. Thank you again so much for watching, and as always, I'll see you again very soon for another one. Until the moment arrives though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.